in the intense world of medical emergencies. One patient, three times, stab wounds. There's nothing more extreme than a code red. So this is a two-car RTC. That's correct. It means there's an immediate threat to life. Got one male still trapped in the vehicle. In the West Midlands, a highly specialist team are on call 24-7, ready to race to these major traumas. Meteor four minutes. By road and air. Zero three wheel lifted from Cosford. Responding to the most severe 999 calls. Open up the Lucas device over there for me. Day and night. All right, well done. From car crashes. Oh, just need to check. To stabbings. Are going to put some oxygen on your pals? Here, where time is critical, lives will be saved. Ah. On roadsides, in back gardens, and inside homes. It's okay, coming off the chest. These emergency doctors and paramedics use cutting edge trauma techniques and surgery normally only seen in operating theatres to save people from almost certain death. Oh, sorry, mate. I oh, know, mate. I oh, know. We're going to sort you out. Filmed over two months with the critical care team. Ready, set, slide. We captured every vital second as these specialist crews work to save lives. On roll. Ready, steady, roll. Tonight... This lad's just ran out across the road. A boy is run over on his way to school. Can you move your right arm? A woman suffers a horrific open ankle fracture. Nice deep breath, well Sandra. That's it, well done. Nice deep breath. A horse-riding disaster. On the left, you know, on the left part of my neck. Yeah and a man has a cardiac arrest in front of his daughter. So what I'm going to try and do, I'm going to give him some sedation and potentially paralysis as well, just so that we can look after all of his breathing. Hello, are you all right, AD? Critical care paramedic Pete Edwards joined the ambulance service 15 years ago. Just so I give the car a bit of a clean. Looks nice when it's clean, so. Five years ago, he underwent specialised training and is now a member of the critical care team. Nearly done, sorry. The critical care team rely on their fleet of high performance vehicles to get them and their specialised equipment to an emergency in the quickest time possible to provide vital life saving backup to the ambulance service. This bag, the red bag, or bag one, as we, we sometimes call it, is, is our enhanced care bag. So it's got some um, equipment in here that they, they don't carry on the ambulances, and that includes sort of surgical equipment. We've got some advanced airway equipment, extra little bits that the, the ambulance crews don't tend to have. Ambulance services are patient breathing. This, this lad's just ran out across the road and I've hit him with the car. Okay. Where's the pain that he's feeling? Where's, where's the pain? In his leg. Are you in the road still? <laughs> yeah, we're in the road. You're OK, left. 13 year old Patrick, hit by a car, patient is still in the road. So, yeah. We haven't got a huge amount, we've got an age. The rest we'll have to uh, figure out once we get to scene. An ambulance has been dispatched, but with a child's life in danger, Pete and fellow critical care paramedic Mike Andrews are also urgently needed. We'll be there first, won't we? Probably. Yeah, we're going to be the first resource on scene, which is a bit unknown at the minute. In a 12-hour shift, Pete and Mike will attend up to eight emergencies. Their skills and training can make the difference to someone surviving or not, but only if they get to them in time. That's completely blocked that way, Mike. Well, it looks a bit. Some of this might just be general traffic, I don't know, or it could be because of what's happened. In these freezing conditions, Pete and Mike will need to act fast to stop the child's injuries becoming critical. Calm to cut the wrong way around a bit there, as much as I want to. I'm going to park us just in front, mate. Right? I'll press us in attendance. Mike, shall I get out and jump and have a quick look? Eight minutes after receiving the call, Pete and Mike are on scene. Morning, how are you oh, doing? All right. Yeah, Hello, Patrick. 
Hiya, mate. I'm Pete. I'm one of the paramedics who Westmi... Are you Mum? Yes. Hello, Hello. Mum. Listen. 13-year-old Patrick was walking to school when he stepped off the pavement into the path of an oncoming car. We're going to have a look at him. We're going to look after him for you. All right, we've just got here ourselves. He's talking to us. That's a good stop. Are you hurt? Uh, just my ear. Just your ear? OK, let's just have a quick look. It's common in car versus pedestrian road traffic collisions for the pedestrian to have sustained multiple injuries. Using their enhanced trauma training, Pete will need to assess him quickly to prioritise treatment. Can you move this arm just gently? Yeah, you can move it. Can you move your right arm? My shoulder. Your shoulder hurts. And what about your legs? Can you move it a little bit? Don't, don't move it too much, as long as you can move. OK, all right. Patrick is able to move his arms and legs so Pete can rule out a serious spinal injury. OK, all right. But the blood coming out of his right ear is a major concern. It's a hemorrhage just out of his ear. Yeah, I'll give him an yeah, update, so, mate. Right. So a potential for a base gun until we investigate it further. Pete and Mike suspect Patrick may have fractured his skull, resulting in a build-up of blood in the brain. If so, he's at grave risk of a stroke or potentially fatal hemorrhage. Happy to pass an ethane. Yeah, mate. Crew on uh, red backup, just to see if we'll get him out of the cold, all right. The Midlands Air Ambulance Service covers a region of six counties and 6,000 square miles, the largest operating area in the whole of the UK. Each helicopter is crewed by a pilot, an emergency doctor and a critical care paramedic. Service is the patient breathing. Uh, yeah, but she's she's struggling to breathe. She can't breathe in. She had a fall from a horse. Oh, okay, she's conscious though. Yeah, well, we don't know if she was conscious when she fell. She was in shock. She walked round. That girl, she can't move. Is she bleeding at all? Not that we can see. Series three lifted with an ETA of four minutes. A local ambulance crew who are already on scene have called for backup a female who is riding a horse at a trot. She's been thrown from the horse and impacted into a concrete step. She presented quite significant pain. She's slightly hypotensive with a very weak radial pulse, looks very pale. Um, crew are struggling to get a handle on any sort of analgesia, I think, due to her, her query, slight compromise on her pulse, etc. Um, and have requested some support. The rider's condition is deteriorating. So the air ambulance has been scrambled with emergency doctor Matt Rowley and critical care paramedic Karen Baker on board. It does make you concerned when you hear that someone's blood pressure is low, that they've got a very weak pulse, that they're very pale. It does make you concerned that she's potentially bleeding somewhere. So hopefully we'll get a better handle on that when we get on scene and get to have a look at it. They need to find somewhere to land quickly. Just coming into the overhead now. A fall from a horse, even at low speed, can cause catastrophic injuries. There are horses absolutely everywhere, but there's a, a field this side. Okay. Just giving it a wide berth because our dog walkers making their way across the field, so hopefully they'll be uh, the other side of the field by the time we uh, make the approach. The rider could have broken her back or be suffering from a potentially fatal internal bleed. Two, three on the ground. Finally on the ground, Matt and Karen arrive on scene. Rachel. Yeah. Hello, I'm Matt, this is Karen. Where's the worst of your pain at the moment? Yeah. Inside your chest. 49 year old Rachel, an experienced rider, was turning off the road into a field when a sudden hailstorm caused her horse to spook and she was thrown onto a concrete path. Can I just have a little feel on the front of your chest? Is that OK? Just tell me if it's painful when I'm pushing anywhere. Her daughter Kelly was with her and called 999. Yeah. I'm here, I'm here. Rachel, I know we're asking you lots of questions at the moment, sweetheart. So, when you got up and walked on your horse, did you have any pins and needles in your arms or legs? I can't remember. I can't remember, OK. Dazed and in agony, Rachel can't remember the fall. As well as low blood pressure and confusion, she's also showing an increased heart rate. All signs of potential internal bleeding. Nothing around there? No, it's all in your back. OK, sweetheart. The pins and needles sensation could be temporary, 
but it could be a sign of a serious injury to her spinal cord. Rachel needs urgent hospital treatment. Let's give that blood pressure again. But Dr. Matt knows that moving her risks leaving her paralyzed. Is that your chest again, Rachel? Yeah. yeah. The bridge, you see. That's all we see, thank you. The critical care team is available 24-7 to attend to the most serious emergencies from road traffic accidents to cardiac arrests throughout the West Midlands. The role's rewarding, uh, I think, uh, it's because it is challenging. It's without doubt a huge privilege to do this job and to ha have this skill set and the capability to, to help these patients at the worst time of their lives. Part of their training is in drugs and anaesthesia, normally only used in operating theatres and intensive care. Just going to pop a little needle into your arm so we can give you some pain relief, OK? So in the most critical cases, they can take over the basic functions of the body to keep their patients alive until they get to hospital. We can obviously put people into medically induced comas and stuff to help manage them. If we have a cardiac arrest and then uh, managed to get a pulse back on a patient. We carry some extra bits and pieces and drugs that we can add to what the crews do to give the patients a better chance of um, survival to hospital. Critical care paramedic Jack Lewis is about to start a 12-hour shift. It's a drug check day, so all of the enhanced care drugs are bags, because if we all turn up at the same job, we all know what's in all the bags, where it all is. It just makes life a little bit easier. Ambulance service, is the patient breathing? Um, yes. Is the patient conscious? Yes. Man, what's the problem? Um, he's really struggling to breathe. He's just literally come on really fast. He's absolutely blue okay. here. OK, OK. All right, OK. Is he still breathing? <sighs> Only just. He's done all this on me now. Is he taking regular breaths at the moment? No. Rocking at the mouth. Is he having a seizure? I think he's having a seizure. OK. Let him go with it. Come on, Dad. OK, they're coming now, darling. Okay, I've got no breathing. Okay, roll him onto his back for me. I'm going to tell you how to give life support. They are pulling up outside, but you need to start this, okay? One hand flat in the centre of his chest, put your other hand on top, lock your fingers together. Keep your arms straight, push yeah. down, hard and fast, two times a second. Yeah. I want you to do that until the crew are right with you, okay? I know. You're doing a really good job. You're doing really, really well. Okay, the here. An out-of-hospital cardiac arrest is always a code red emergency. Without swift action, the man, 79-year-old David, could die in minutes. The local ambulance crew has called for immediate critical care backup. This is a crew request uh, for assistance uh, for an elderly man. I think the call initially came through his fitting, but is, I believe, now cardiac arrest. And I think they're struggling with some uh, airway management options, which is one of the skills and health skills that we carry. Thanks to his daughter's prompt action and the crew's response, David's heart is beating again, but without enough oxygen, his life is hanging by a thread. Jack carries drugs and resuscitation equipment that could save his life, but he's still five minutes away from the address and may not get there in time. Downtime has been, I think, fairly considerable. I think call time was 20 past two, and we're now approaching 2.40, so we've had 20 minutes of potentially cardiac arrest, so it might be that by the time I get there, actually we're past the point of making a meaningful difference for this gentleman and we go no further. Uh, 62. Hello, mate, how are you doing? Jack arrives at the address and is immediately briefed by the paramedic team so he can lead the treatment. We have 74-year-old David. Hello, David. 79-year-old. Yeah. Um, collapsed, daughter says his breathing went funny. Yeah. Uh, she started CPR. Initially uh, querying if there was a carotid when we got here, yeah. there was a gonal breathing. Yeah. Uh, he arrested at 14, 19. OK. And we got a ROSC at 14, 35. Nice one. Daughter Caroline, who was with him when he collapsed, has been joined by other concerned family members. Awesome um, job. The paramedics have inserted a tube into David's throat and he is now breathing with the help of a ventilator. I'm just going to get some midazolam and then at that point we'll put him onto my ventilator because it's, it's just a bit better for him, if that's OK. Yeah. 
Jack needs to get David to hospital for urgent test to find out the cause of his cardiac arrest. All right, Dad. Nearly done. But for now, he's focused on just keeping him alive. David, you're doing really, really well. When we get him on the ambulance, we'll just have a few minutes, we'll get him sorted. Back in Smethwick, critical care paramedics Mike Andrews and Pete Edwards are at the scene of a road traffic accident where a 13-year-old boy has a serious head injury after being run over on the way to school. Just looking at the car for some indicators of how hard the car has hit him and potentially for injury patterns, really. So where the, he's obviously gone onto the bonnet, but the windscreen is intact. So he's got a, he a head injury and some bleeding from his ear, so we, we need to look at that quite quickly. It's likely Patrick's head would have taken the main impact of the blow, potentially fracturing his skull. Patrick, do you, do you think you were knocked unconscious at all? No. All right, just, just have a look, just a second. Checking his pupil's reaction to light will show whether he has suffered a concussion. Have you got any pins and needles anywhere? No. OK. All right. How bad is the pain at the moment? What do you mean? Is that the worst pain? And what about your shoulder? Is it just when you move it? OK, all right, no problem. The ambulance is here now. What we're going to do, we're going to get a proper look at you in there, all right. Pedestrian, 13-year-old male, uh, struck by a car. As West Midlands ambulance crew arrive on scene, Mike updates the critical care trauma desk on Patrick's condition. Query basal skull fracture. Well, the patient is conscious and talking to us. He's just got a bit of a hemorrhage coming from his right ear. Now the ambulance is here, they need to get Patrick to hospital as quickly as possible. He's got a head injury. I think we need to get off him. We'll get him immobilised. So if you could grab your stretcher and scoop. We haven't stripped him off because he's going to get freezing cold. Look. Yeah, yeah. So are you all right with that? Is that OK? All right. Let's do a few little checks on you, OK? See so how you're doing. Peter and Mike need to be sure they don't aggravate any undetected injuries when they move him. I, th I think without the collar, oh, I'm, I'm right. yeah, but what we'll do, we'll get us, he's moving it, just keep your head nice and still, Patrick, that's it. He's moving his head freely and he's moving all his limbs free, he's got no paralysis. Okay. Um, he's, we'll have to get this bag off, I think, so it might be just a okay. case, we'll have a look at that in a second. Has anybody got any shears on them? Keeping Patrick as still as possible, Pete oversees the ambulance crew as they position the scoop stretcher underneath him. Any pain in your tummy? Mm. Nothing? No in your back? Lower back? That's good stuff. OK. Right. Just let us do all the work, Patrick. OK. We're going to just do... There's going to be a little bit of movement, mate. You're going to be a pinch of you, aren't you? All right. Now, it might pinch your bum. Tell us if it does and we'll stop. You've got his head just clear of that, mate. Yeah, Once the two halves are snapped together, Patrick's head and neck must be immobilised. Yep. Yeah. OK, right. Before it is safe to move him onto the stretcher. Got some graze into the temporal region there. The other thing I just, we need to have a look at is his sort of upper thigh pelvis region, because where, where the dent is on the bonnet, it, it looks like that's down. where it's uh, struck him. Yeah, if that makes sense. So, ready, steady, lift. And ready, steady, down. OK. So, that's, you're right. All right, nothing to worry about. We're going to look after you, OK? OK, go and feet first, then... What we're going to do, we're going to take some of these clothes off, all right? Yeah. On the ambulance, Pete can oversee a full-body examination. He's worried Patrick may have broken a bone in his pelvis, which could rupture the femoral artery, causing him to bleed out and die. Take a nice big deep breath in for me. Big deep breaths in. It's clear. It's equal. OK. So he's, I've checked his pupils, they were leaking and active right. He's got some, an abrasion to the top of his sort of the right side of his forehead. And he's got this blood coming out of his ear that I can't see where it's coming from. So in terms of hospitals from here, he's nice and stable, but just because there's blood out the, out the ear, I, I, I think sway towards the children's, what do you think? Patrick is alert and doesn't seem to have broken any bones. Pete is happy he is stable enough to leave him in the care of the ambulance crew to take him to Birmingham Children's Hospital to be further assessed by the emergency doctors. It's the weekend, but there's no let-up in life-threatening emergencies and no rest for the critical care team. 2, 20, 20. 
critical care paramedic Tom Waters is prepping for his shift. Saturdays, obviously, more people are off. More people want to do certain things. People are more active. Um, so, yeah, I think that could mean a busier day for us. The weather, it's, um, it's not too bad outside, so we'll see how the day goes. But we're booked on. We're good to go. We've got our drugs out. And it's a bit of a waiting game now. Ambulance service is a patient breathing. Hi, I'm not sure. Literally just seen a crash outside of our house. The car's literally like written off. Okay, so it's the one car. Yes, it's one car who's gone into like the wall. Did you see how fast the car was travelling at all? It was going quite fast again. Like more than fifty. That's absolutely fine. I am going to be on scene in thirty seconds. Thank you. With a car crash in a residential area, there's the danger of multiple casualties. Police, fire brigade and ambulance have been called and specialist trauma backup is also requested. RTC, don't really know what's going on, but it's here. At the scene, a crowd has gathered on the pavement. Oh shit. The vehicle, a rental car, has somersaulted into a brick wall and the driver is nowhere to be seen. Which way did this car come from? Do you know? OK, right. And did you all see it? OK. Does that catch you anywhere when you breathe in? In Wolverhampton, Dr Matt Rowley and critical care paramedic Karen Baker have flown nine miles in the Midlands Air Ambulance to rescue 49-year-old Rachel, who is in a critical state after she was thrown from her horse onto a concrete path. Any pain in your tummy? No. Good, OK. What were sats on there? 100%. OK. It was just the fact that Catherine was a bit slow in. OK. Any pain there in your tummy? Yeah. Yeah. No, OK. Rachel's low blood pressure and poor circulation, along with her memory loss and severe pain in her upper back and ribs, is a sign that she may be suffering from life-threatening internal bleeding. Do you want to take this, the mask off right now and just see how she's saturating without the mask? What I'm going to do is just have a little feel underneath your neck at the moment, OK? On the left, you know, on the left part of my neck. Yeah. If where the ball is, mm. I'll be there as well. Have you? Okay. Yeah. Got when I'm pushing that on your neck, tell and me if you've got... a tiny, tiny... No, gone there. OK. There. There, is that on tender the in the middle of your neck? Is it the bottom of my finger is there? OK. Rachel needs urgent hospital treatment, but before Matt allows her to be moved, he needs to be sure she hasn't fractured any vertebrae, which could result in paralysis. How much morphine she had off your time? Five. Just five. Yeah. Should we go for the... Yeah, let's go for another five, and then we can give her another ten, then, can't we? She had any antiemetics yet either? Yes. No. She's had the on dance trial. Yes. Examination's yes. fine. Um, oh, yeah. Let's give her a bit more, a uh, bit more opiates, and see how we get on. Dr. Matt judges the precise dose of analgesia Rachel needs to help her tolerate the journey to hospital without risking a drop in blood pressure that could cause her to black out again. She'd be good for New Cross. Yeah. I agree with you. I think New Cross, think, yeah, might have something in the right chest. I think we're so close. I don't think she probably warrants giving anything stronger like ketamine or anything. It's a nine-minute journey to New Cross Hospital. Rachel will travel in the ambulance with her head and neck immobilised in a collar to protect it from any further damage. All right, Jude, if your pain was a 10 at the start, where are we now, do you think? About a three? OK. Yeah. Let's give her another two and a half or something. She's quite comfy, isn't she now? So, initially assessed her on scene. They've been slightly concerned because she's quite pale. Her initial blood pressure is a bit low, and she's got significant pain on the right side of her chest when they're breathing in and out. So, um, quite rightly, they've been fairly cautious with the analgesia that they're given to start with. Her observations have improved, and that's enabled us to give more morphine. Right, I am going to go and start loading the. Uh... The motor back up. OK. With Rachel's condition now stable and her pain under control, Matt and Karen leave the ambulance crew to transfer her to hospital. 
She's now fairly settled. She's able to take big, deep breaths in and out, and the pain has, has subsided slightly. So they're going to take her to the nearest hospital from here. Player. In Dudley, critical care paramedic Tom Waters is at the scene of a road traffic accident. Hi, buddy, you're right. Yeah, I'm okay, mate. It's just a few bumps and bruises. The car somersaulted off the road into a lamppost. Miraculously, the driver, 39 year old Carl, walked free from the wreckage and is being treated inside the ambulance. The car is absolutely total, yeah, isn't it? Like, it is, yeah. like yeah. It's, it's, it's been through a massive roll, isn't it? Yeah. And then the men flipped that like as well, yeah. All... And it was just you in the car, just wasn't me it? In the car. And if you hit, I'm just, I'll go check, nobody else has yeah. been hit, all right, and then. According to Carl, the accident happened when he was run off the road by another driver. Are you happy for me to? He, yes. he looks absolutely fine, doesn't yeah, he? I don't, I don't like the fact, yeah. So the fact he's self-educated, yeah. he's walked, he's chatting, he's yeah. GCS 15, he remembers it all. Yeah. If anything, he can go to local. Oh, there you go. Hey, bud. Are you getting your phone? Yeah. All right. Extraordinarily, Carl seems most anxious about his mobile phone. So basically, the one gentleman is the. Um, he's just getting his bits and pieces out of the car. Well, he done this? Long story short rammed off the road, um, hell of a mechanism. He just wanted to check his stuff, so... Um... All right, bud. Do you want me to have a look for you? Yeah, Do you want... Yeah, go and have... We'll get... Yeah, yeah. Go and have a sit down in the... Um... Take those bits for you. My phone is in there. It's a... OK. On a 20 I light. OK, well, well, we'll make sure we... Yeah. Get... I just need to get it because my mum was on... OK. ...try to ring the let, let, the let the guys just yeah. save it. We'll get it for you. Go and sit in the ambulance. Cheers. Can I get the phone, though, the phone? Yeah, yeah, we'll ask one of those guys. We'll get you the phone. I promise you. But can we get you inside yeah, first? What's the... What's your... Bloody lucky, isn't he? Yeah. He's really desperate for his phone. Satisfied that Carl has not been seriously injured, Tom is happy to leave him in the care of the local ambulance crew. In Birmingham, critical care paramedic Jack is treating 79-year-old David, who is fighting for his life after a 15-minute cardiac arrest. Daughter Caroline and other worried family members are also on scene. So he's had a cardiac arrest. He's had a cardiac arrest that's been prolonged for quite a period of time. Because of that, his brain's been starved of oxygen, even with good CPR. So it's likely that if he starts to try and come around too much, he's going to be very agitated and quite difficult to, to look after. As a highly trained paramedic, Jack is authorised to use specialised drugs normally only used by doctors in intensive care in hospital. So what I'm going to try and do, I'm going to give him some sedation and potentially paralysis as well, just so that we can look after all of his breathing, all of his awareness. With David barely conscious, Jack must decide whether to put him into an induced coma to protect the vital supply of oxygen to his brain and organs. OK, so he's had three milligrams of midazolam. He's had that now at 14.48. If he has another cardiac arrest while he is under full sedation, it will be much more difficult to resuscitate him, and he may die. Yeah, so eyes are open, but not, he's not really responding to you. He's localising, so that's a five. Yeah. Ben, can I have a conference call, please, with senior cover for to discuss some rock? Rocaronium bromide is a fast-acting muscle relaxant normally used in operating theatres before major surgery. Hi, Neil, you OK? Good. Thanks, mate. Um, so I've got a 79-year-old uh, gentleman who's had a witness cardiac arrest at home. Jack wants to consult with the senior doctor on call before he decides whether to go ahead and use it. I'm giving him a small amount of midaz, so three milligrams, just to try and flat him out a little bit. So the call is to discuss plenty to add rock over the top of that to facilitate um, kind of a safe extrication and get him off to hospital. Let's try the SIMV first, no problem. Yep, sounds good to me. Thank you very so much, Neil. Have a good day. Take care. Bye-bye. For now, Jack will keep David on the ventilator at his current level of sedation. Have you got a full cylinder there, guys, or a nearly full cylinder? We've got a, we've got a spare one on the other side. Perfect. So if we pop that on the where yours is, yeah. So what this will do is it will support the breaths he makes, uh, and it'll add a couple in over the top. I'm happy if we want to just break the scoop and we'll start sliding it underneath him and get him packaged, but we'll obviously just keep it nice and steady, keep a close eye on him. Looks like he's fighting a little bit, isn't he? 
It's common for someone who has suffered a cardiac arrest and been resuscitated to re-arrest again on the way to hospital. We'll get him strapped and packaged, we'll do one last check, and if we're happy, we'll extricate him out to the stretcher, get him onto the ambulance, reassess him there. The way he's going, I probably will end up giving him some rock on the back of the vehicle and just making sure we're settled for the transfer, but if you're happy now, we'll get him out. Yeah. I'll grab the vent and the monitor. <laughs> one, two, three. OK, just watch out for all of this. Is nice slow time. If you keep coming forward, we'll get out behind you. Nice uh, and high there. So just grab my, make sure I've got the little yellow handbaggy thing with the drugs in it, which should be on the chair, and the red bag. Is, is that all right? Thank you. Am I all right? Nice and slow. On board the ambulance, Jack makes his final checks. That's right, so we've got airway. We've got IGL size four on a circuit that's working. He seems to be tolerating it fairly well. I'm not convinced that we're getting... He's not making very effective rasps. He is breathing for himself, but they're not particularly strong. On that basis, um, I would feel more comfortable taking over uh, yeah. and I'll giving him the rock. Uh, 7.8, I think it was. Having weighed up the risks, Jack decides the safest course is to take over David's breathing entirely. So once I give him this, obviously he won't make any movement, he won't breathe for himself, but it's really important that we keep an eye out for things like tearing, tachycardias, and a raise in his blood pressure, because yeah. those are things that are going to indicate maybe some awareness. OK, so I'm going to give him the rock now. Once the neuromuscular agent has taken effect, David is now effectively in intensive care conditions, his body unable even to breathe by itself. 60, thank you. We're about to leave for Heartlands. Um, are you ready for an atmist? He has now had, in total, eight milligrams of midazolam, and I've given him the 50 of rock, because he was struggling to, to fully synchronise with the ventilator in the end. Before they set off to hospital, Jack updates the trauma desk on David's condition. We will be eight minutes to Heartlands received. Yes, right, eight minutes to Heartlands. That is affirmative. Leaving one of the ambulance crew members to drive his vehicle, Jack will not leave David's side until they arrive at hospital. All right, David. Well just, done, David. We're off to the hospital, sir. So we've just become a little bit hypertensive again. So we just want to make sure that that's not any awareness. He's not becoming tacky. En route, Jack and the ambulance paramedics keep David under close observation. The slightest fluctuation in his blood pressure could be a sign that his heart is about to stop beating. You've got some global ischemia, yeah. but that's normal. That's for brief perfusion, so I'm happy with that. Arriving at hospital, Jack can deliver his critically ill patient to the waiting cardiac team in intensive care. The skills that we provided there were the sedation, the advanced ventilation, the paralysis, the management of that post-ross patient who's you know, potentially very unstable, although he did quite well, and make sure that he was handed over effectively ready for ITU. So we had an airway in place. He wasn't aware of what's going on. He wasn't distressed. He wasn't in pain. Um, and we were able to effectively put him onto an advanced ventilator and ensure that his um, physiological needs are taken care of. The plan now, hopefully, will be to head back to base, restock, uh, maybe have a cup of tea, uh, but we've still got a couple of hours left in the shift, so I could end up going to anything in that period of time. Um, we're just hoping for a, a slightly more sedate last few hours, um, but we'll see what comes through. The critical care team in the West Midlands are on the road 24-7, 365 days a year. No problem at all. At night, the car is crewed by a hospital doctor and a critical care paramedic. Do you know any raps? <laughs> <laughs> Yo, my name is Tom and I'm very I'll come up bully. With one, yeah. <laughs> I'm a bit of a bully, yeah. Oh, perhaps, perhaps not that one. <laughs> Dr Tom Woolley is a hospital doctor who works 16 shifts a month for the critical care team. Ryan James is a full-time critical care paramedic, working an average four shifts a week, day and night. I think I'd struggle to work within a hospital environment. Certainly in the winter months, you go into work, it's dark. Yeah. You spend all day under artificial light. <laughs> and you don't get to go to these fine dining establishments. No, you don't get to go <laughs> yeah. to the chicken outlets. <laughs> I'm 
ambulance service. Is the patient breathing? Yes, it's me. I'm on for my foot hanging off. Blood everywhere. My foot's just... It's just a detached. I can feel the bone sticking through. All right, we're not far now, mm. OK? A couple of minutes. Oh. In Warsaw, Dr. Tom Woolley and paramedic Ryan James are en route to a code red emergency. We're going to a 71-year-old lady with what sounds like an open ankle fracture, so there's a um, break to the skin. There's a paramedic crew on the scene, um, and they've asked us to come and assist with them. Open or compound fractures can have serious complications and need urgent treatment. Wounds are easily infected and disrupted blood flow can cause long-term damage to limbs. Just ahead. Tom and Ryan are only two miles away. If it's a really nasty, deformed ankle fracture and she hasn't got any pulses in her foot, that might be another reason uh, why they might want to call us to try and realign the fracture. Six minutes later, Tom and Ryan are on scene. Close. Hello. 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 What's your name? Sandra. Sandra. Hi, Sandra. Can I have a little lick of your foot, OK? Seventy-one-year-old Sandra has broken the two biggest bones in her ankle. That's a decent fracture, that is, isn't it? The snap shards of her tibia and fibia have speared straight through her flesh. I never get the 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 Sandra was in such agony after her fall, it took her two hours to drag herself across the floor to reach the phone for help. Sandra, yes. can, you, can you feel me touching your foot there? Yeah. You can. It's a horrific injury, but Tom is concerned there may also be unseen damage to her nerves and that could result in her losing the foot. How's she coping with the Entonox? Sandra's been given gas and air for immediate pain relief. Just hold on to that, okay. pop it on your face, and just take slow, steady, deep breaths, OK? Make a full seal. But what Ryan and Tom need to do next calls for something much stronger. And you've got IV access, have you? Just yeah, and that's it working it. all right, is it? It's about a third attempt. Give some of the good stuff as well. Yeah. Before they can move her off the floor, Sandra's shattered ankle must be realigned. So Ryan gives her liquid morphine to help dull the agonising pain as Tom pulls the bones back into place. Sorry, Sandra. Nice deep breaths for me. Nice deep breaths, well Sandra. Done. That's it. Well done. Nice deep breaths. Nice deep breaths. Keep going. Well done. You're doing a great job. Deep breaths, Sandra. Don't hold your breath, sweetheart. That's it. Nice, steady, in and out. Big deep breaths. Well done. Do you want to split yeah, it all yeah, first? Yeah, yeah. Let's do that first. Yeah. The worst part may be over, but they still have to lift the injured ankle up off the floor into a temporary splint. Well done, Sandra. You're doing really well. While maintaining the bones in their correct alignment. OK, well done, Sandra. Well done, darling. Sandra. Just keep taking that gas as well. Keep taking that gas. Nice long deep breath, Sandra. Well done. Tom and Ryan now need to work with the ambulance crew to get Sandra to hospital as quickly as possible to prevent any further damage to her foot. We'll get the stretcher in, scoop her off the floor and get her on, shall we? Yeah, yeah. Just take some breaths of normal air in between. Is it still really sore? Just a bit. Just a bit. OK, all right. So you just lay where you are. We're going to get you onto a stretcher. We need to get you to hospital, cos you've, you've broken your ankle and it, it, do, it doesn't look particularly and now, great. 
the bones. It's an open fracture. That's right, it's an open fracture. And it's been does it right. So we need to get some antibiotics into you and we need to fix it for you, okay? Bothered. She's got quite a nasty looking open ankle fracture. What that means is the bone protruding. And so because it's quite a lot of damage to the, the skin around, um, we're going to take it to the QE uh, in Birmingham, which is a major trauma centre, rather than uh, the local hospital, just because she might need um, orthopaedics and plastic surgery, potentially. While Sandra gathers her strength for the next part of her ordeal... Are we going to get around this corner? Uh, I think we're going to struggle, to be honest with you. Yeah. Ryan and Tom need to work out how they're going to stretcher her out of the house. It's getting through here, isn't yeah. it? Or back in there, because we can't even go in there. So straight in here. What if we go blue Still carry sheet and then we can to. get around the corner? The only option is to bring Sandra out on a flexible plastic sheet. But the extra movement that will involve means Sandra must prepare herself for more pain. Sandra, listen to me, sweetheart. You're going to slide you into your hallway and then we're going to open the door and then we're going to have to manoeuvre you a little bit out of the front door, OK? Look, it's fine. Yeah. Come towards me. Now, Pecky. Hang on, sit up, guys. Hang on, that's it. There we go. All right. Is that OK? Do you think you'd be able to put your hands on the floor and then shuffle your bottom to the right-hand side? Do you think you'd be able to do that? Well done. Take your time. Is that OK? There That's we go. it, well done. Lie yourself back down now. OK. Oh. We're just going to put some more pain relief in your hand, all right? Sandra's played her part brilliantly. Now it's up to the ambulance team to complete the extraction as quickly and painlessly as possible. All right. You OK? Yeah. Yes. Any new pains or anything like that? No. OK. OK. Happy, Tom? Yeah, yeah on three, one, two, three. You're just going to try now, all right, bear with yeah, us. Everyone happy? Yeah. On slide. Ready, set, slide. OK, well done, Sandra. OK, we're, we're clear. You OK? Keep your head up, sweetheart. Ah, it well done. OK, yeah. right, should we lower down there, everyone? Yeah. And we'll just pop her on the stretcher. On lift, everyone. Ready, set, lift. OK, walk forward. Oh. Keep well coming, done, Sandra. keep coming, keep coming. And lower there. Oh. Well done, Sandra. It took 10 milligrams of morphine, some gas and air, and a lot of courage on her part, but Sandra is now safely on the ambulance. Nice to meet you, Sandra. Yeah. I'm getting off now. Well. This gentleman's going to look after you. Uh, yeah, nice to meet you, chap. So okay, shall I? Knowing their patient is in a stable condition, Tom and Ryan are happy to leave her in the care of the crew for the 14 mile journey to hospital. The ambulance crew will take Sandra to the QE. They'll hand her over to the emergency department there and the emergency doctors will then speak to the orthopaedic team about uh, admitting her to hospital for further treatment and probably need surgery on that ankle. In the intense world of medical emergencies, one patient, three times stab wounds. There's nothing more extreme than a code red. So this is a two car RTC. That's correct. It means there's an immediate threat to life. Got one male still trapped in the vehicle. In the West Midlands, a highly specialist team are on call 24 7, ready to race to these major traumas. Each in four minutes. By road and air. Zero three wheel lifted from Cosford. Responding to the most severe 999 calls. Open up the Lucas device over there for me. Day and night. All right, well done. From car crashes. Oh. 
Just need to check. To stabbings. We're gonna put some oxygen on your pal. Here, where time is critical, lives will be saved. Ah. On roadsides, in back gardens, and inside homes. It's okay, coming off the chest. These emergency doctors and paramedics use cutting edge trauma techniques and surgery normally only seen in operating theatres to save people from almost certain death. Sorry, mate. Oh, no, mate. Oh, no. We're going to sort you out. Filmed over two months with the critical care team. Ready, set, slide. We captured every vital second as these specialist crews work to save lives. Tonight, here four minutes. a man is crushed beneath a quarter-ton engine. Fire will be there to get the get engine off his legs over. On the top floor, in the top corner here. A cardiac arrest on a squash court. Onto your back, John. Oh. Sorry, mate. A DIY disaster. Isolated abdominal injury with partly eviscerated bowel. Hold on to my hand. And a passenger is trapped after a serious car crash. Have you got some morphine to draw up? I think he's going to need it no matter what, isn't he? The critical care team was formed with one aim to save more lives. Operating 24 7, and crewed by highly qualified doctors and paramedics, their fleet of vehicles are prepped with life-saving equipment and ready to scramble at a moment's notice. What day is it? It's Sunday. It's 7 o'clock in the morning. 32-year-old <laughs> critical care paramedic Tom Waters is about to start a 12-hour shift. We check all our kit every day so then nothing gets missed out. I like to just make sure everything's in a special place. It all gets used on a daily basis, so make sure nothing's missing. After working in the ambulance service for six years, Tom underwent 18 months specialised drugs and life-saving skills training to become a critical care paramedic. In ambulance, traditionally, we'd only see a major trauma patient or someone who's suffered a significant car accident or has hard to stop beating maybe once or twice a year where our job is to deal with cardiac arrests, uh, major trauma patients on a daily, regular basis. Ambulance service, is the patient breathing? Yes, yes, yes but well, the person's on the floor. Awake. Yes, but the yes. person has cut the belly. Have they oh, fallen? Have they put the yeah, on the chainsaw? Are they able to seat to me? No. Oh my God, okay. everything's out. His intestines? Yes. Has he lost enough blood to fill two mugs? <laughs> yes, a lot. Please, just come. We're coming on blue lights and sirens, so we're going to be there as quickly as we can. It looks like a 43-year-old male um, who has sustained an abdominal injury from a chainsaw and his intestines are out on the floor. An ambulance is already on scene, but the man's injuries are so severe that they've requested critical care backup. Tom has been dispatched. It's easy to paint a picture, but you really don't know until you get there. 11 minutes after receiving the call, Tom arrives at the address. His body cam records every detail of the horrific scene. Hi, you're right. Yeah. Hello, sir. My name's Tom from the Air Ambulance. What's your name? The injured man, 43-year-old forklift driver Rafa, is being given oxygen by the ambulance crew to try and keep him conscious as his body reacts to the shock of the five-inch wound to his lower abdomen. Right, so with this, um, if you just want to cover that with that. Perfect. I'm, I'm just taking a photo of it. No, that's fine. Just in case you... Uh, no. Right, then. It looks like it's adipose tissue yeah. or anything, doesn't it? The blade has sliced down through skin and flesh, exposing his intestines. Oh. Tom needs to try and keep the wound clean, prevent his intestines coming out and stop the bleeding. Hopefully, if we can just 
hold it around it, it will stick to it a little bit. And then, if I can get you guys to put some tape around that, is that all right? I'm just going to stick the dressing down, Raphael, OK, just to keep it clean. OK, so this gentleman, um, age, I believe you already know, he's a GCS of 15 at the moment with an uh, isolated abdominal injury with partly eviscerated bowel. With such a deep wound, Tom knows Rafa could have catastrophic internal bleeding. He needs to get him to hospital fast for emergency surgery. I think my initial plan would be to get some IV access, wound management, and then convey him to the QE. The danger is that moving him may put too much strain on him and send him into cardiac arrest. How are you feeling? Sam, can you get some IV access? Is that right? The most serious emergencies require a doctor-led trauma response. The Midlands Air Ambulance can fly a hospital doctor and critical care paramedic to 90% of the region within eight minutes, delivering advanced life-saving care to the roadside and fast transfer back to hospital. Ambulance services, the patient breathing. Yes. Are they conscious and awake? Yes. Me and my husband are moving some um, mechanical equipment around the back of our house and it fell on him and he's broken his wrist and he's like a big engine sitting on his leg. Okay, so he's trapped under it at the moment. Yeah. What's it, an engine from a car or? A car, yeah, a Land Rover. Okay, so we thought we'll be with you as quick as we can. So we got you four minutes. Have you got any details on the case, please? Dr Matt Rowley and critical care paramedic Karen Baker are en route to a code red emergency. Patient in the back garden who's been working on the Land Rover's engine. Uh, it's uh, fallen onto him, trapping his by his legs. Fire will be there in order to get the get engine off his leg further. A man is lying crushed beneath a quarter of a ton of cast iron. The range of potential injuries are so severe, the critical care team have been scrambled. Our point of view would be go do an assessment, look at his airway, breathing, circulation, and see if there's any immediate interventions we need to perform that may be life-threatening to him. Helimed is above the house within minutes. OK, you think I've got, yeah, fire service. Uh, da, 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 da. Just coming down the right-hand side there. So it looks like this field here is going to be about the nearest. Uh, There's horses in that, unfortunately. We're just looking if there's anything in that. Yeah, that's no, fine. Yeah, OK, cool. We'll go with, uh, go with that. A paramedic working on a regular ambulance will only see a couple of major trauma incidents a year. All good on the left there, Cass. Yeah, all good. Thank you very much. But these guys deal with the most critical emergencies every day of the week. There's a catch in there. Zero three on the ground. It's now been 15 minutes since the 999 call came through. Matt and Karen are concerned the longer the man is trapped under the machinery, the more damage is being done. If they've managed to get it off quite quickly, then we'll be looking at some soft tissue damage and fractures. If it's stayed on his legs, how long it's crushed his legs for, because then you'll get problems with circulation. Hello. How are we doing? You're right. Says so you can feel it. Obviously, it hurts. Yeah. Arriving on scene, Matt and Karen are quickly briefed by the fire service and a local ambulance crew before they can take control of the rescue. Yeah, he's got a collis fracture on his left wrist as well. OK. Um, so we're just in the process of um, getting the engine off. OK. What's your name, fella? Dave. Dave. My name's Matt, one of the doctors off the air oh, ambulance, sorry. Right. Scrapyard manager and Land Rover enthusiast Dave Evans was renovating one of his old vehicles when the heaviest part, the engine block, fell off the workbench. Can we get you back on this gas and air? Dave tried to stop the fall, but the huge weight was too much, breaking the bones in his wrist. And it's just toppled over onto him from there, has it? Yeah, yeah, yeah. The ambulance crew have splinted Dave's broken wrist and given him gas and air and intravenous morphine to help him deal with the pain. How's he doing with the morphine? He's done 15. Oh, I'm to be on Although Dave appears calm, Karen is worried about the potential injuries to his leg that they can't see. Is it from the lower leg? What can you see just around the neoparty below? Has he got a distal sensation? 
Karen is worried the engine could be restricting the blood supply down his leg. This could lead to Dave losing his foot. Hello, we're all, we're all. It's essential they get the weight off before it's too late. The critical care team cover an area of 5,000 square miles in the West Midlands with a population of 5.6 million people. Ambulance service is a patient breathing. Every day, the ambulance service receives around 4,000 emergency calls. But when the call is critical and there's every chance the patient won't make it, that's when the trauma specialists are needed. Going to the big job now. See you later. The number one call out is to people whose heart has stopped pumping effectively and gone into cardiac arrest. Coming through a big cardiac arrest in the street. Yeah, that's all received. We're showing about seven minutes away. Every minute the patient's in cardiac arrest, their chance of survival decreased by about 11%. So the quicker someone starts CPR, the more likely it is that um, the, the patient will survive neurologically intact. Obviously, we're hoping when we go to a cardiac arrest that we can get an output back. We've got the Lucas device, which we can use, and we've also got um, drugs that we can give, medication, uh, which obviously increases their chances of survival. Service patient breathing? No. It was someone who phoned on the court next to us. There's stuff around him and they're doing CPR. Right. I know that they've got access to a DFib then. I presume that one of the staff members got it. Yeah, yeah they have. Good. Okay. Right, we are coming as quickly as we can. Okay. okay. A 72 year old collapsing with a sudden cardiac arrest is an immediate code red emergency. Good. Two local ambulance crews have already been dispatched to the scene. But as fewer than one in 10 people who suffer an out of hospital cardiac arrest survive, 28 year old critical care paramedic Aidan is also en route. The AED is being used, one shot being delivered. Excellent, thanks, bud. A bystander has managed to restart the man's heart with a defibrillator, but it could re arrest at any moment. I'll go, Lucas in hand. The Lucas chest compression system allows Aiden to continue resuscitation mechanically even while on the move. It's a vital bit of life-saving kit for the critical care team. Looks like it's uh, in a squashed course on the top floor. Arriving at the sports centre, it's now 20 minutes since the call came through. Excuse me, upstairs. Yeah, absolutely. It's up from the top floor and the top floor again. Yeah. Thank you. When a person has suffered a cardiac arrest, Time is critical. Every minute the brain is starved of oxygen, there is a greater risk of stroke and long-term brain damage. Hello. How are you doing, everyone? How are you doing? Hello, how are you doing? Hello, how are you doing? Four paramedics are already treating 72-year-old John. Went to hit the squash ball, collapsed, fell flat on his face. The gentleman over there gave him mouth to mouth, chest compression. Yeah. He started breathing again. His condition was so serious, it took staff at the sports club six minutes and three attempts with a defibrillator to get his heart started again. Has he got chest pain or anything at the moment? He has got chest pain, like, all over. OK. Very The paramedics have put John on an oxygen mask and hooked him up to an electrocardiogram to give an accurate reading of how well his heart is functioning after the cardiac arrest. We'll just sit him onto his bum, stand up on his feet, John. stretch him behind him. Onto your back, John. Taking charge of the scene, Aidan needs to get John off the floor, onto a stretcher and into hospital. All right, what's happening? Where's that pain? If he has a second cardiac arrest, it's his best chance of survival. When you guys got here, he was, he was GCS 15, a bit, a bit agitated, but he was conscious and stuff. Uh, no, he was, uh, he was very combative, he couldn't talk. OK, let's just shave all this off for okay. a second we can, and then get, um, get the pads on. It's obviously a high chance of re-arresting now. Although John is conscious, his brain was deprived of oxygen for six minutes. It's left him confused. John, yeah. where's that hurting, mate? Yeah. In your chest? Yeah. OK. Does it feel like you've hurt something as you've fallen? I don't know. You don't know? Okay. John, are you listening? So, I know that's really painful, 
we've got to get you up off the floor in order to get you uh, into the ambulance and off to hospital. So bear with us. Right. Let, let us help you. Just wait a second. These chest pains are a sign of restricted blood flow to the heart. It's a clear warning that he is in danger of suffering another cardiac arrest. Match me right. First of all, John, just sit up for us. Not stand, just sit for a second. All right, just wait there. Three, After three, then, John. One, two, three, push. Let's have a seat on there. Sit down, John. Right, John. relax your head down to the right. Down to the right. We'll swing your legs up. One, two, three. Just square yourself up into the middle for us, John. OK. Having got John onto the stretcher, Aidan is able to manage his airway and restart chest compressions if necessary. So he's not had any medication or anything yet? No. No. Look, I'm just going to give you a bit of a spray in your mouth. Might make you feel a little bit lightheaded, a little bit dizzy. If it does, just let us know. OK. The tongue up for me. Lovely. And pop this in your mouth and just chew that around for me. Aidan gives John a nitroglycerin spray to expand his blood vessels and an aspirin pill to thin the blood to increase the flow around his heart. Now he's ready to start the journey to hospital. Was it yourself who did the CPR? There's a few people. Yeah. Well, you, you guys have absolutely saved this man's life, so you should go home very happy. Well done. Thank you very much. Guys, nice and steady, just slow it down just a bit. Leaving his vehicle at the gym, Aidan will travel with John in the ambulance in case he has another cardiac arrest en route. Right, it's going to be a bit bumpy, OK? He won't leave his side until he's safely delivered to hospital. Nice and steady there. Yeah? Yes, he will need to. In Walsall, critical care paramedic Tom is treating 43-year-old Rafa. He needs urgent hospital treatment following a DIY accident with an electric saw that's cut open his abdomen. All right, we're going to cut this off. It isn't safe to move Rafa until Tom knows the full extent of his injuries. I just want to check his back while we're here. Yeah, it's very sweaty, isn't it? OK, so no other injuries. Was this done on a chainsaw? Yes. Can you find out exactly what's happened? The gentleman there speaks English. How are you feeling? He went on the ladder. He was doing something around this thing. Yeah. And, yeah. It turns out Rafa was fixing the guttering with an electric saw. This one? Yeah. When the ladder slipped, the saw ripped through his abdomen. Yeah, 6'2", just an update. So heart rate's around 50 at the moment. Rafa's blood pressure is low, which could be a sign that the blade has damaged some large blood vessels internally or even perforated the bowel. He's quite clammy and sweaty at the moment. I see no immediate signs of him hemorrhaging, uh, however, I don't know how deep it is. They have to get him to hospital. I'm going to get him in the back of the ambulance and convey QE. I'll put some details for as we go. OK, then, Rafa, we're going to put our chair here. We're going to get you to move you and take you into the back of the ambulance, OK? My only concern is he's a bit hypotensive, so he might go a bit funny yeah. if we stand up. So we'll try and obviously avoid as little movement as possible. Hold on to my hand. OK. Do you feel like you can walk? No. OK, that's great. Are you sure? OK. Despite Rafa's horrific injuries, Tom has no choice but to move him onto the ambulance. Yeah. Keeping the pressure on the wound to stop his intestines spilling out. I'm just a bit worried he's a bit hypotensive, so we'll just take our time. Well done. OK. Up you come. So, at the moment, this gentleman's got a circular sore accident to his stomach, part of his bowel, and a lot of his stomach is, is out at the moment, so we've addressed it. I'm going to give him some drugs to stop him bleeding and uh, pain relief and take him to the major trauma hospital in Birmingham. I'm just going to give you some pain relief, some paracetamol, OK, to help with your pain, Rafa. How are you feeling? Yeah? They head to the major trauma centre at the Queen Elizabeth Hospital, where Rafa will need immediate surgery to repair the wound and stop any internal bleeding. Rafa, are you all right holding that? On the journey, 
Tom needs to keep his patient under close observation. There's a real danger his low blood pressure could suddenly drop, putting him into cardiac arrest. Buffer, how are you feeling? All right? Good. Well done. You're doing a great job. We're nearly there. Arriving at hospital 23 minutes later, Tom can hand over his critically injured but now stable patient to the waiting specialists. Thank you. In an average 12 hours, Tom will attend around eight life-threatening emergencies, testing his techniques, drugs, and specialized equipment to the limit in some very challenging environments. I've obviously seen the worst in people and the best in people, but I've, I've never really had an issue of um, taking it home. I've got a very small baby and a fiance, and that pretty much fills my life in the evening, so. There are days where you have jobs which you get flashbacks. You know, at worst, it's always children, isn't it? But um, fortunately, I seem to manage quite well with that. I feel like I'm relatively thick-skinned. For Tom, there's no such thing as a quiet shift, and there's never long to wait after the end of one job until he's needed again. An ambulance has been dispatched to an address in Dudley for a code red emergency involving a seriously ill child and they've requested critical care backup. Five minutes away and we don't need too much information but we think it's a 10 year old who's not very well. Sick children can go downhill very fast. A sudden onset of disease can easily overwhelm their body's vital systems, so early diagnosis is paramount. Assessments of children are generally really hard. And there's always things that can get missed. He arrives on scene 14 minutes later. I went in through the side. The paramedics have already moved the child into the ambulance. Hey, buddy, you're going to be sick. Can we have you around? <laughs> All right. It's every paramedic's worst nightmare. Products. The boy is presenting advanced symptoms of one of the most deadly childhood diseases. I think that kid's got meningitis. Let's come off the oxygen just for a minute, guys. We'll just come off the oxygen. In Wolverhampton, critical care paramedic Aidan is battling to keep 72-year-old John alive and breathing after he had a cardiac arrest while playing a game of squash. Sorry, mate. Relax. If someone's got some morphine on this truck, if someone can draw some morphine up if that's, if that's OK. And then we'll work on just getting a posterior ECG, see whether we can get him straight to, uh, to PCI. John was without oxygen for six minutes before gym staff restarted his heart, which left him confused. But 27 minutes later, he is starting to become more lucid. John, so I think something's happened to your heart. OK. So we're going to be taking you to hospital shortly. Okay. You've had a collapse whilst playing squash. Yeah. We'll take good care of you. All right. Okay. Well, have you ever had a heart attack or anything like that before? Uh, I had a murmur once. A murmur. OK, you never had surgery on your heart? No. No, OK. It's now 33 minutes since John collapsed. Right, John, yeah. we're just taking a little scan of your heart. Okay. We need you to stay really still for a second. OK, nice and still for us. Aidan needs to run a second ECG to try and find the cause of John's cardiac arrest. Just two seconds. Is that a good trace? It's all right? Yeah. Yeah. So, guys, we'll head off in just a second. If it's OK, just have someone who can drive my vehicle. I can do it with somebody else in the back, though, just in case he has another arrest. Yeah, just nice and steady, bud. That'd be great. And it's just going to be a little scratch on your, your hand, OK? En route to hospital, John is given 2.5 milligrams of morphine, a fast-acting painkiller, to help make his journey more bearable. So, John, so we're going, we're going to New Cross Hospital at the moment. Obviously, we think there might be something a little bit wrong with your heart at the moment, uh -oh. OK, which has caused you to have this collapse. OK, so when we get to the hospital, there's going to be quite a few people there who are going to want to speak to you and ask you some questions, OK? We'll take good care of you, OK? 
You say you're winning the game of squash. Are you sure? <laughs> Do you normally win against this chap? It looked like um, an elderly gentleman. Sydney, I'm fine with you again. <laughs> 40 years. Yeah. Mikey. You should be all right by now, then. Uh, I'm to that one. You, you've had a period where you've lost consciousness. Okay. Yeah. So um, that's that would be expected. Right. Yeah. Six minutes later, they arrive at New Cross Hospital, where Aidan delivers his patient safely into the care of the waiting cardiac specialists. For John, it's been a lucky escape. Obviously, I had a cardiac arrest, a really serious situation. We're probably in the best situation that we could be now, considering he's had this cardiac arrest. So uh, he's now relatively stable, his heart's beating OK, he's breathing. So uh, they're going to do a few more tests to see exactly what it is which has gone wrong with his heart and treat him appropriately from there. So really happy, really good outcome, and just emphasising the importance of bystander CPR and community access defibrillators, which undoubtedly saved this gentleman's life, so, yeah, really good. Twelve miles away in Stourbridge, Dr Matt Rowley and critical care paramedic Karen Baker are on scene with 40-year-old Dave, whose leg has been trapped under a quarter of a tonne of Land Rover engine for the past 35 minutes. Every second counts, because without proper circulation, there's a real risk that the leg won't recover and it will have to be amputated. The leg can just go ischemic. You cut off the oxygen supply and then that builds up toxins. And then, of course, when it's released, those toxins can then go into the, the main circulation. The fire brigade are trying to free Dave using hydraulic lifting equipment, but without a clear view of his trapped leg, it's hard to get the machinery into the correct position without risking even more traumatic injuries. Right, that's it, really slow, deep breaths now. He's had 15 milligrams of morphine and continues to take gas and air to deal with the intense pain. Right, let me hold it. Good man, that's it. And again, deep breaths. With the lift now in position, the firefighters and medics work together. Good. Deep breaths, Chris, what's forced to do this, mate? Go on. Sorry. Deep breaths, I say, well done. Ooh. Hold on. Hold on, Chris, just hold it there. Yeah, you're going to help yourself, sir, would you, right? Go on, four ways. Go on, four ways. Go on, four ways. Go on, four ways. Go on. Hold on. With Dave's leg finally free, Matt and Karen can assess how badly it's been damaged. Come oh on, let's have a little look at it. Oh. How's your pain now that you've come out? Yeah. Just speak to what my foot's been crushed, but I don't feel like it's broke. My is... wrist is definitely broke. <laughs> Are you tolerating the pain at the moment? Yeah. That's a lot better. Really right. Good. That's good. That's all right. Good. Toes a bit blue. Give your toes a wiggle. Good man. Hold well on. Miraculously, despite being trapped under a quarter of a tonne of cast iron, Dave appears to have escaped with just some painful bruising. Shall we get your chair, do you think? Yeah. We'll pop him in a chair and go over the back. She gets, she gets to shout at you, know you're all right. <laughs> You'll just have to do it in the house next time, won't you, where it's dry? It'll be all right. He's been very lucky. It's just sort of pinned his leg to the floor. He's got no serious injuries. Um, people can come off much worse if he'd fallen on his femur, his pelvis, his abdomen, his chest. You know, his injuries could have been far more significant. Dave is being taken to hospital by the ambulance crew, leaving Matt and Karen clear to respond to the next emergency. Over in Dudley, critical care paramedic Tom has just arrived on scene, where a young boy is critically ill. Are you going to be sick? Can we have you around? <laughs> All right. He is displaying symptoms of meningitis septicemia, a rare bacterial infection that kills 10% of children who catch it. Oh, bless him. <coughs> and sorry, um, he's 10 years old, isn't he? Yeah, yeah. 10. OK. 
Ten-year-old Harry was sent home from school yesterday with what seemed like a vomiting bug. Now a rash has started to spread across his body. See you in a bit, Harry. Your mum's coming forward with you, OK? A dangerous sign the disease is advancing fast. I am 1.2 grams dissolved in 4 mils, 1.2 grams, 4 mils. Tom knows if his diagnosis is correct, he doesn't have long to get the infection under control before it enters Harry's bloodstream, where he won't be able to halt it. We're going to give him an injection to his arm as well. Um, he's going to have to have two injections, if that's all right. Tom will need to administer the potentially life-saving antibiotic there and then before they get to hospital. Well done, buddy. With her son's life hanging in the balance, Harry's mother, Laura, can only stand by and watch. That's the first one. Go ahead. I had some choice, Bobby. Just wondered if you had any clinical update with your recording. Uh, yes, it's got quite a significant um, rash along his body. Um, reduced ECS, uh, given his Ben Pen now. What's the actual copy uh, of speech of it? So that's, is that the, that's... 600. 600 yeah, so, so he's having 1.2. Right, then we'll get ready to go. Are you ready, yeah. mate? Tom knows it's critical they get Harry to hospital as quickly as possible, where he has the best chance of recovery. Do you want me, how about if I do the pre-alert for you, and then you get, you could get going then, yeah, couldn't you? Cool, yeah. There you go. And I'll say seven minutes to Russell's Hall. Immediately, the second dose of antibiotics is in, the crew prepares to leave, while Tom calls ahead to pre-alert the hospital staff. Hello there, it's uh, Tom, one of the critical care paramedics. Can I pass you an alert, please? A 10-year-old boy, he's had a two-day history of being generally unwell, nausea, vomiting, not his normal self, very pale, and got a clear uh, blotched rash along his body. They're going to be seven minutes to yourselves. Obviously, we've got a very high suspicion that he's got meningitis. For all ambulance crew, dealing with a critically ill child is the most stressful situation they have to face. Thanks to Tom's training and experience, Harry has the best chance of recovery. What that child needs is a good hospital quickly. The fact that he's got a very typical septicemic rash over his body with the history of him being unwell and deteriorating throughout the day and looking very poorly, um, those factors mean he, he needs antibiotics and he needs a hospital very quickly, and that's all we really did. It's a very rare circumstance you go to a child with presenting with those symptoms. What I was very conscious of was not delaying on scene, so that's why I passed the details and let the crew, you know, deliver that care ongoing. They're doing a great job. So, um, you know, I just might pop and see how they go on. The critical care team in the West Midlands operates 24-7, 365 days a year. Dr Katie White and critical care paramedic Ian Locke are on standby, waiting for the next emergency as the all-night trauma response unit. I think you get used to it. You do get used to it. I think, I think it gets harder as you get a bit older, I think. Um, Locke would know better than me. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> In the early hours of the morning, a call comes through to ambulance control. A car has been involved in a high-speed collision. A man is trapped inside with life-threatening injuries. Critical care backup is required. We've been called to a road traffic collision. We've been asked to attend by a crew in attendance um, to a patient who has crushed their car into a concrete wall. From spinal paralysis to life-threatening internal bleeding, the impact of high-speed collisions on the human body can be devastating. They are just pulling down the Crescent Road towards the scene now. Dr Katie and Ian know they're going to have to get there fast if they're going to save a life. I don't know, it's all received. 
Eyewitnesses report the car was seen traveling at a high speed down the dual carriageway when it hit the roundabout. We haven't got many reports of exactly what the injuries are yet, but um, if the crew are requesting us, then um, it's likely that they find something that they've got concerns about. 21 minutes after receiving the call, they are at the scene. The police have had to close the road and firefighters are hard at work trying to free the injured passenger. Dr. Katie is a consultant anaesthetist. She spends half her time in a hospital and half on the road, responding to life-threatening emergencies. This vehicle has been seen driving at really high speed. Down here, and it's basically just gone head first straight into this entire concrete structure. To get her up to speed on what's happened, Katie is briefed by the paramedic operations manager who is managing the scene. The driver is out walking around absolutely fine. The front seat passenger, when the crew rocked up, had quite a substantial laceration and head injury. Okay. Still trying to assess for other injuries, just trying to get those pain under control. Okay. It's so distracting for him at the minute. They're just going for a roof removal and to bring him out that Fantastic. way. Fantastic. With the injured man still trapped inside the badly wrecked car, a member of the fire brigade is using the jaws of life, a hydraulic saw, to cut the roof away while another protects him with a blanket as the blade passes inches from his head. Um, head injury. Drown that. The man is conscious, but he was thrown around the car when it smashed into the concrete wall and may well have sustained serious internal injuries. So I believe this gentleman has um, come from down this road, which is quite a fast dual carriageway, um, hit this concrete bollard. He's actually moved the concrete bollard, shunted it back backwards. Um, and interestingly, what we've just seen is that he's actually managed to bend the metal railing behind. And there's a significant drop the other side, so I think it's quite lucky that that concrete bollard's there. Having examined the crash site for further clues as to how sick her patient might be, Katie wants to assess the driver who managed to walk free of the crash. I've obviously seen the crash has been involved in. Up. He's all right. They're just going to get him out. Get him. Shall yeah. we get you somewhere where I can have a look at you? Yeah, it's not mine. Yeah, yeah, I think I agree with that. Come on, let's go. Um, let's go down towards the ambulance, and I'll just find somewhere to um, see you. Satisfied, the driver is fine. Katie heads back to the crash site, where, with the roof now off the car, Ian is finally able to examine the passenger. 22-year-old restaurant manager Sahil has been fitted with a cervical collar to protect him from aggravating any possible spinal injury. He's also complaining of severe pain in his left arm. Do you want to take one side and I'll take the other? Get on this. Sahil's legs are unharmed, so it will be less painful on his other injuries if he can stand on his own feet and be helped out of the wreckage. So what we're going to get you to do is to stand up, all right, turn very gently, we'll support you as you're doing it, and put your bottom kind of in the middle of the stretcher, OK? And then what we'll do is we'll get you to lie down, OK? So, so you keep your neck nice and still. Where's it hurting? On your arm. OK, so not touch that arm. OK, you support that arm and then come up towards me. OK? It's just too sore. OK, all right. Do you think if somebody was behind you, helping you just get up and out of the seat, that might help? OK, all right. If it's too much, we'll get some more pain relief for you, OK? OK, do you want me to support your arm? I can't do this. You can't. If it's a no-go, don't worry, mate. No? Okay. Shall we... Shall we go back to Plum B, then we'll yeah. go the back. Yeah. Yeah. OK, Rich, long boarding down the back. Sahil's arm is too painful for him to be helped to stand, so Katie and Ian will have to resort to Plan B. Have you got some morphine to draw up? Has he had any? Or has your crewmate drawn any? I think so. I think he's going to need it no matter what, isn't he? With Ian in charge, the fire brigade start to slide a spinal board behind Sahil before carefully levering him out. Once he's flat, he can be lifted onto the stretcher. We're just going to take him in the warm. Thank you. Okay. Lovely. There you go. No, no worries. How are you doing? All right. How old are you? 
22. 22, oh, OK. My name's Katie, I'm one of the doctors. All right. Um, what's hurting at the moment? It's Sorry? This arm. So I think it's that arm. Yeah. So oh, the oh, options oh, are, oh, do you want to hold on to that? Yeah. I'm just going to okay. cut your clothes, lovely. So we'll get some pain relief in. Yeah. Shall we splint it? Free from the wreckage, Katie urgently needs to examine to heal. Being thrown around the car, he could have broken a rib and punctured a lung or shattered a bone in his pelvis. No, we'll Take a couple of nice deep breaths. From us, it was nice and yeah. yeah. That feels all right. Okay, lovely. Injuries top to toe, he's got a head injury, no obvious chest, abdo or pelvis injuries. He's got an obviously fractured left humerus with no neurovascular compromise. Sahil is lucky. Despite the seriousness of the crash, he's escaped with a broken arm and a cut to the head. He's had some IV morphine, an IV paracetamol, and a splint to his left arm. Crew ETA to Sandwell will be 10 one zero minutes. Received. Roger, Katie, yeah, that's all copy. Thanks so much. I'll get that past you now. Thank you. Katie and Ian leave Sahil with the paramedic crew, who'll transport him to hospital while they prepare for the next Trauma Code Red. Moves like Concrete Barrier, you'd think... ..lucky. That patient needs to go to a hospital department where he's going to get a CT scan to have a look, to just make sure that there aren't any other injuries that we can't see. We didn't feel he needed to go to the major trauma centre or that he needed us to go with him because I don't think, as a critical care team, we were going to add anything more to his care en route. Um, he has had some pain relief. We splintered his arm and, um, and now he just needs to go and have that thorough check over and then he, he's clearly going to need a surgery on that, that arm. Intense world of medical emergencies. One patient, three times stab wounds. There's nothing more extreme than a code red. So this is a two car RTC. That's correct. It means there's an immediate threat to life. Got one male still trapped in the vehicle. In the West Midlands, a highly specialist team are on call 24 7, ready to race to these major traumas. Detail four minutes. By road and air. From responding to the most severe 999 calls. Open up the Lucas device over there for me. Day and night. All right, well done. From car crashes. Yeah, just need to check. To stabbings. We're going to put some oxygen on your pals. Here, where time is critical, lives will be saved. Ah. On roadsides, in back gardens, and inside homes. It's okay, coming off the chest. These emergency doctors and paramedics use cutting edge trauma techniques and surgery normally only seen in operating theatres to save people from almost certain death. Oh, sorry, mate. I oh, know, mate. I oh, know. We're going to sort you out. Filmed over two months with the critical care team. Ready, set, slide. We captured every vital second as these specialist crews work to save lives. Tonight, a teenager is bleeding to death from a stab wound. 
Okay, put a direct on there then. Don't fight, don't fight. I know it's scary. An accident with an angle grinder. Is it pretty bad? Okay. He hasn't seen it. Okay, all right, bud, all right, bud. An elderly man with a serious head trauma. Yeah, you've taken a bit of a beating, haven't you? I think the road's won this time. And a woman has a life-threatening seizure. Emma Mee, you're going to look after you, OK? Service station breathing. He's come off his bus for he's conscious. unconscious, he's breathing, all his teeth are gone and everything. He's, he's in a bad way, his face is at the, at the road. And he, did he seem to be taking regular breaths? He's breathing very, very fast. He's the patient yeah, um, in the road? He's in the road, yes. Yeah. How old do you think he is? I'd say he's in his 60s. Not all his teeth and everything. We've got an ambulance en route, OK, so just keep your yeah. eye out for the ambulance. I will do, yeah. A local ambulance has already been dispatched to the scene of the accident, but there's a high chance the man has suffered paralysis or brain damage, and his life may be at risk, so critical care backup is needed. We'll get, we'll get back on. The male in his 60s that's come off the motorbike. Uh, 60s, that's obviously, thanks very much. Um, I think it'll be about eight minutes of it. Critical care paramedics Will Meadows and Colin Apps deal with life-threatening emergencies on a daily basis. Their advanced trauma training gives the most gravely ill the best chance of survival. Yeah, the information's come through that he's... Um, unconscious, that would suggest that he may well have serious injuries, including injuries to his head. Ten minutes after receiving the emergency call, they are on scene. The local paramedics have taken the injured man into their ambulance. Yeah. Sorry, guys, uh, my name's Will, uh, one of the critical care paramedics. I'm uh, Joe. Paramedic Joe quickly briefs Will on the details of the accident so he can begin his assessment. He's been travelling on his motorbike, no helmet. Push bike, sorry. Push bike. Yeah, apparently the front wheel has locked up. Yeah. He's gone over the handlebars and full impact on the front of his face. OK. 73-year-old Fred, a retired crane driver, was riding back home after visiting his 99-year-old mother when the accident happened. Bystanders state that he didn't move to start with, um, so we're querying a period of unconsciousness with him. Um, on our arrival, he sat up, he's talking, he's fully orientated, he knew where he was, but he couldn't recall the incident of what had happened. OK. Fred's injuries are so extensive, he needs urgent hospital treatment and a brain scan. We've got a good two-inch laceration above his right eyebrow. Um, initially, they said that he wasn't moving. At the very least, he has concussion but the memory loss and blackout could be the sign of a much more serious brain injury. It's Friday night and Dr Adam Lowe, a consultant anaesthetist at Birmingham's Queen Elizabeth Hospital, is getting ready to start his shift for the critical care team. Tonight, he's paired with full-time critical care paramedic Rob Davies. It's very hard to predict on any day of the week, but Friday night, people are out and about. Uh, social nights, there'll be more people in the city centre. We may well be busy in and around Birmingham. So yeah, we just get our checklists uh, done, make sure we've got all our kit ready. Hopefully a nice, gentle evening. 12 minutes later, an emergency call comes through to the base. Well, very nice, thank you, good evening. Um, the young adult, please, is going to do the 21-year-old male with a stab wound. Um, the stab wound is two inches long on his upper back. Um, query with a knife. Um, the officers on the notes query a friend doing outside. Um, there's nothing to suggest police on seeing that. 
Last year in the West Midlands, there were nearly 5,000 violent knife crimes. Reducing the number of deaths is one of the critical care team's main objectives. Thank you. I'm sure the victim told you as well, crew is on route. We believe these offenders are outside the property and the patient is inside the property. Details are being passed to the police at the moment. All right, thank you. Just to confirm, these are police are not yet to the tender, so we believe the offenders to be outside of us. I think that's received. Uh, we're about two minutes out, so is there an RVB point over? With the attackers believed to be nearby, the trauma desk instructs Adam and Rob not to go directly to the house, but wait for police protection. The two people are outside who they think have done it, uh, so they're advising us not to go directly to the house. It's that balance, really, isn't it? Because if it's still an aggressive scene or, or not secure, we don't want either ourselves or, or other members of the ambulance service getting injured. Thank you. Uh, please just pull the location. Just stand by you and It's 7.38 p.m. Police and ambulance crew arrive at the address, so Adam and Rob get the go-ahead to enter the property, while our camera operator is told to wait outside. Right. Oh, all right. Are you guys on your own? Yeah, yeah. You are going to need to go to hospital. Let me just see your front, make sure you haven't got any injuries here. The man is in shock and distressed with a stab wound to his back. It's unclear to Adam and Rob whether or not he knew his attacker. OK, well, lie down onto your side, then. Lie down onto your side. This on, the, on his left side of his back. We're just going to lift and go around the corner, then, yeah? Happy? But he's lucky. After assessment by the critical care team, it's decided, whilst it's a nasty cut, it's not life-threatening. They're not nice incidents to go to, um, but we go to stabbings fairly regularly, so it's it's not a surprise that we're being tasked to a stabbing. Unfortunately, it's one of those things, and living and working in the urban environment, stabbings are fairly common and are uh, quite a significant workload for major trauma centres as well. In the West Midlands, critical care paramedics deal with around 30 stabbing incidents a week. and they don't have long to wait for the next one. We through the ambulance. Is the patient conscious and breathing? Somebody stabbed him on the, on the neck. OK. Do you, know, do you know if he's breathing? He's breathing at the moment, yes. He needs the ambulance as quick as possible. What? A lot of blood coming out. Is the blood spurting out? Yeah. It is, my love, OK. Oh, my God. Just keep <laughs> pressing on his neck, my love. We're coming as quick as we can. Oh, God. I've never seen anything like this. It's getting worse. Just keep the pressure on that bleed, love. You're doing all you can. We're on the way to someone who's been stabbed in the neck and it's spurting and there aren't any crews there yet, but they're going to let us know when someone gets there. The second stabbing of the shift sounds very serious. Spurting blood may mean a major artery has been cut. Adam and Rob need to get there fast as there's a danger the victim could bleed out and die. You're clear on my side. They are stopping. Yeah, still stopped. Police and the nearest ambulance have also been dispatched to the scene. Adam and Rob are just five minutes away, but with a serious stab wound, every second counts. Yeah, thank you. Um, just to keep you up there, we're going to keep having uh, extra cold on this. Um, I think people are panicking a lot on the scene. Um, the drugs going on the scene is still bleeding through the towels that are being, um, that have been applied. There's a lot of blood on the floor um, and patients back to the floor. Yeah, that's great. We're one minute out. A stab wound to the neck could have severed airways as well as arteries. As trauma specialists, it's one of the most challenging situations Adam and Rob can be faced with. Hi, guys. Hi, guys. I'm Adam. I'm the 
Dr. On Meadows Hello, behind you, you okay? Mm -hmm. Okay, don't don't fight, don't fight. Adam immediately takes control of the scene, locating and assessing the size and severity of the neck wound. Yeah. Okay. Can you hear us? Okay? Right. So quite a lot. What sort of you breathing? He's bleeding heavily and struggling to breathe. <laughs> OK. Adam, can you see down there? The victim is just 16 years old. <laughs> Ambulance services, the patient breathing. In 2012, the West Midlands Critical Care Team and Midlands Air Ambulance joined together to create a specialist trauma response unit. We've got more experience in dealing with patients who are critically ill or injured. Let's do a few little checks on your OK. Let's see how you're doing. 38 doctors and 34 critical care paramedics bring hospital-level care to those most in need. What we provide is to bring an advanced care team to the patient at the roadside. I'm just going to have a little lick of your foot, OK? Nice deep breath. Well done. By focusing on only the most serious emergencies, their enhanced skills and training often make the difference between life and death. I think they've proved that with a good trauma network nationally, that you're 60% more likely to survive a trauma. It's very intense at times and demanding, but thoroughly rewarding. I love my job. <laughs> Ambulance services, the patient breathing. Uh, yeah, he's had his hand in uh, a steel saw. A steel saw? Yeah, it's gone straight through. Uh, yeah, I don't want to describe it too much. How far through his hand has the saw gone? Uh, Dan, you need to move your hand, please, because I need to describe it too. I, just, uh, I need to put your hand over your face. Uh, Hold on. Uh, oh, very, 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 very bad. We get to one to him as soon as we can. Just keep the pressure on the wound, directly on the wound. An accident with a power tool can inflict life-altering injuries. An ambulance has been called, but they've requested specialist trauma backup, and critical care paramedic Tom Waters is now en route. Looks like I'm going to be first on scene, and it's someone they just said he's cut through his hand with an angle grinder. DIY gone wrong. The benefit that I think my team and myself can, can go to is we can hopefully make that assessment to really identify what hospital is best for that patient. Ten minutes later, Tom is on scene. The local ambulance crew are already there. Hello. Hi, you're right. So what's happened? Some... He was cutting the door frame um, there and went straight through his hand. 30-year-old bricklayer Daniel was cutting the timber on a workbench using an angle grinder with a four and a half inch circular blade when he lost control and it sliced through his right hand. His wife Stacy found him and has been trying to stop the bleeding. Okay, and how bad is it before we have a look at it? Is it pretty bad? Okay. He hasn't seen it. Okay, what's your name, sir? Uh, Daniel. Daniel. Are you, do you live here, do you? Is this right, okay. Yeah. The paramedics have been on scene for five minutes. Daniel is in a severe state of shock and close to passing out. They've got him to raise his arm above his heart to try and stop the bleeding. It's fine. Uh, have you got your trauma pack with you? Uh, no, I can go grab some Yeah, I think maybe if, it, if you're saying it's quite bad, we'll get our bandages just in case. Have you hurt yourself anywhere else? No. No, so it's just your hand? Yeah. Do you mind if I...? Yeah. This impressive towel you've got on here. It's the second one. OK. OK, so what we'll do, before we um, open it up, we'll get our bandages just in case. Daniel's in excruciating pain and can't bear to look at the damage he's done. So, all right. Are you all right to come round here and cut his sleeve off? I've got some scissors on me, if you want, yeah. It's incredible. OK. I know, I know, sorry, buddy. We'll give you some pain relief, but what I want to do is have a real quick look at it first. Until he can actually see the wound, Tom doesn't know if Daniel has cut an artery or is in danger of losing any fingers. Both require immediate surgery. 
Okay. All right, bud. All right, bud. Did he get himself off the floor and self mobilise into the back he, here? Well, no, he, we took the stretcher out to him, cleared his C spine, managed yeah. to stand him up and he stood onto the stretcher. In Walsall, critical care paramedics Will Meadows and Colin Apps have been called to the scene of a serious head trauma. He's got a full laceration to the top of his lip, um, complete laceration on his tongue as well, so it's kind of lizard tongue at the front. Right, eh? Um, three teeth have come out and also laceration to the bottom lip where it's hanging. Okay. 73-year-old Fred was travelling at speed on his bicycle when he was thrown headfirst onto the road, landing on his face. He blacked out and is now dazed but conscious. Have we found the teeth or are they...? Yeah, we've got three of them there, OK, yeah. so there's three missing and you found them all? Yeah, okay. the ones at the back look quite broken as well. There's nothing there I can see that's okay. gone through the palate yeah. at the top. Do you mind just opening your mouth there, sir? Stick your tongue out again, Fred, for me. Will checks Fred's mouth to be sure there is no obstruction to his airway or damage to the roof of his mouth. How are you breathing? Is it okay? Yes. Yeah. Yeah. Okay. Does it? Are you in much pain at all? No, no pain. Just a, a little bit of bruise there. Yeah. yeah. Try not to touch your face there, yeah. sir. Okay, because we don't want to contaminate that. But yeah. Yeah, you've taken a bit of a beating, haven't you? I think the road's won this time. Yeah. Yeah. <laughs> okay. Will is most worried about Fred's unseen injuries. His head took the full force of the impact. Head traumas are very unpredictable, and there is a risk he may have damaged blood vessels that could turn into a more serious bleed on the brain. I don't know what happened, actually. No, I don't think you're going to have the answers either, Fred. Accidents happen really quick, don't they? Are you on any blood thinners at all? No. No? No medication, no, no medical treatment. No medication. Okay. Is it still bleeding inside your mouth? Yeah, try not yeah. to touch it, though, Fred. Yeah? yeah. yeah. Don't you know that bit between the top lip and your nose? Yeah. That split vertically. Yeah. Will calls into the trauma desk to alert them that Fred is likely to need reconstructive surgery on his face. Um, he's got split lips. He's had three teeth knocked yeah. out. Oh, They're all accounted for and <laughs> his tongue's been split as well, sort of in the middle, and um, quite aptly described as, as lizard tongue. Got a pulse rate of 98, SATs of 96%, TSA clean, and a rest rate of 80. C-spine is clear. Part of Will and Colin's expertise is to ensure Fred is sent to the appropriate trauma centre that can treat all of his injuries. OK, so what I think he's probably going to be needing some Max Fax um, yeah, no. specialist. Well, Fred, yeah. what we're trying to figure out is where we're going to take you, where's best to get your face repaired, all right? Just going to figure that out at the minute, OK? Yeah. The Queen Elizabeth Major Trauma Centre in Birmingham has specialist maxillofacial surgeons who can assess and treat Fred's head wounds. OK. Not surprised. That lip damage, that filter from damage, that's all from the front teeth, isn't it, where he's, he's pretty much kissed the floor, hasn't he? So. You're a tough bloke, Fred, aren't you? Oh, he still was. <laughs> Fred, I'm going to ask you again, sweetheart, do you want any pain relief? Yeah. Yeah, just a bit of pain for you. Do you want pain relief for no, you? No, no, no. No, no. No? No, it's all right. It's fair enough. Try not to keep dumping it, though. Amazingly, Fred seems to be untroubled by his injuries. He wasn't wearing a helmet. If he had been, it may have deflected some of the force of the blow and given him more protection from serious long-term brain injury. If you're getting blood into your mouth, just let it dribble into there. Try not yeah. to force the spit, just let it dribble out. As it stands, he will need a brain scan to rule out any potentially fatal clots or bruising. How fast do you normally cycle there, Fred? Oh, no, no. It's not got a battery in it, has it, your boy? No, no. no. It's so an just... ordinary racer. A racer? Yeah. <laughs> yeah, I'm saying. Uh, yeah. So, yeah. 40 more now, then. Head yeah. down. Still... Trouble desk is going to give them a heads up. Uh, so you can be seen sooner rather than later, and if they can't manage Fred, then they'll get him transferred to the QE where, where you can go. All right. Lovely. We'll get out of the way. I'll okay. Take Thank care. You much. Have a nice day. All right, Fred, you mind how you go, OK? Next time, wear a helmet. Do you know what happened? <laughs> <laughs> All right, guys, Thank thanks you. very much. See you later. Cheers. It's a six-minute journey to hospital. Happy that Fred is stable, Colin and Will leave him in the care of the paramedics, freeing them up for their next emergency call. Yeah, he's a, they seem to be... Stoic. Yeah. 
very good pe pain threshold. I would have been crying. Ambulance service, there's a patient breathing. Um, she's having a fit. Does, has she been diagnosed with epilepsy? I don't know, I'm, I'm not sure, sorry. Okay. She's fitting really badly. 6-2, uh, we're showing about five minutes away. It's reports of a 39-year-old female who's having a seizure in uh, the Merry Hill shopping centre. She's been having headaches, and now today she's gone on to have a fit. A woman is in the throes of a potentially life-threatening seizure. The critical care team are urgently needed, and critical care paramedics Mike Andrews and Pete Edwards are en route. He's actively That's what we're seeing when it goes Seizures are caused by surges of electricity in the brain and are an indication of epilepsy, a neurological disorder that kills 1,000 Britons every year. Oh, there you go, visual. I'll get the red bag. Do you mind grabbing the drugs? In the shopping centre, a building society clerk has suddenly collapsed at work and started fitting uncontrollably. Her shock colleagues called 999 an ambulance crew is already on scene. Hello, how are you doing? All right. How's it going? I'm Pete, I'm one of the uh, paramedics. This is Mike. 39-year-old Emily is lying unconscious. The ambulance paramedic who has been looking after her updates Pete on her condition. She was fitting for about 15 minutes before we got here. Yeah, OK. Um, she's fitted for oh. 2 minutes 54 while we've been here. Yeah. No history of head injury today or anything like that. So, so, so we just got migraines recently. Had a seizure today. Just today. Just today. Yeah. Okay. All right. Can you squeeze my hand, sweet? Um, Can you squeeze my hand for me? As part of his assessment, Pete needs to know if Emily's ever been symptomatic before. So she is an epileptic. Is that what we're saying? Um, when she was little, she did used to have it, but not recently. Right. Okay. So she hasn't had a seizure for a while, but she has had them in the past. We're talking about this time last year. The last one. Okay. People's jaws often clamp shut during seizures, which restricts the airways. If starved of oxygen, Emily could go into cardiac arrest. So Pete needs to administer diazomal, a muscle relaxant, to stop her convulsing. You should put a bandage on so we don't lose the IV access. Are you able to? Is that all right? I'm just thinking that if you start fitting again, we might might get pulled out, mightn't it? Worried that Emily may start thrashing around when she fits. Pete needs to be sure the IV line is securely attached. I think they've got IV access. If she starts fitting again, we'll, we'll go to as moles. Yeah, is that all right? Is that what you're thinking? Yeah, yeah. And BM and everything's all right. I think the best thing, we'll get a stretcher. Yeah. Get her onto the vehicle. Yeah, OK. Pete wants to get Emily to hospital, but she takes a turn for the worse. Is that wound or is that dressing? What's that there? Dressing. In Birmingham, trauma doctor Adam and critical care paramedic Rob are trying to save the life of a boy who's been stabbed in the street. Can you see? Yeah. Here. Okay. So we've got one behind me, yeah? Yeah. Is there anything at the front of the neck? The 16-year-old has a deep wound to his neck and it's spurting blood. OK, put a direct on there, then. He's already lost about a litre of blood. The human body contains five. Adam knows he can't afford to lose much more before he passes out and goes into cardiac arrest. What's going what's to happen now? Listen, what's going to happen? Don't worry about them. Look at me. What's going to happen? I'm going to get you onto an ambulance, OK? Let me just see if there's any blood in your mouth. Open your mouth wide. Good lad. Nothing. Pressure from his wound is causing the boy to panic and restricting his breathing. Just calm your breathing. You're doing absolutely fine. I know it might feel hard where you've been injured. OK, it's away from your voice box. I know it's scary, OK, but you're doing fine. I'm pushing on the side of your neck. They need to get him to hospital for emergency surgery to repair the blood vessels in his neck, but moving him risks tearing the wound and sudden catastrophic blood loss. Not time. OK. OK, it's all right. Listen, have you got phlegm at the back? Just spit yeah. it out, mate. Just spit, Just spit it. it. Spit it. Spit it. Spit it. Spit it. 
Adam needs to keep the boy calm while maintaining a constant life-saving pressure on his neck to stop the bleeding. Do you feel able to stand, mate? Yeah. OK. Right. Good lad. Yeah, go on. I'm not going to let go because I need to put that pressure on. OK? Oh, hold on, guys. Hold on. I need, well, I need to keep the pressure on. Can you get around, mate? Are you in? So, bump, bump there. That's it. Lay down on the bed. OK. Once on the stretcher, it's now a race against time to get him to hospital. Fine, mate. You OK? Can we have our bag on the back? Yeah. Uh, my hands are going to be a bit tied up just to keep that pressure on. So let's get some straps on. How are you doing? All right, well done. OK. I need to keep to the QE. Yeah, I need to keep my hands on to stop the bleeding, OK? Because you have bled reasonable amount. Any medical history I need to know about? Asthmatic? Sickle cell? No? Are you allergic to anything? Right. Okay. Leave a little bit of room for me. That's it. Well done. Good, so a bit brighter in here. On the ambulance, Adam and Rob can now fully assess the damage the knife has done. Hi, mate. Right. He's, he's bled a fair bit of volume and he's still bleeding past my hand, so I need to get a grip on where that's coming from. The tacky 130, active from the back. It's not anywhere major vascular, but it is actively bleeding. Can I have that cellox? Because I can see where that's coming from now. Well done, Adam. Using a gauze coated with a blood clotting agent, Adam manages to stabilise the wound as much as possible to prepare for the journey. Nice and steady. All right, buddy. We're going to sort you out. We're going to take you to the QE. Good work. You're doing great, mate. You're doing great. Have you got pain anywhere else? No. OK. 12 minutes after they arrived on scene, Adam and Rob are en route to hospital. OK, Rob, do you want to carry on looking at access for me? Yeah, yeah, give us that arm. The boy is in such a critical condition, they both need to travel with him, continuing emergency care throughout the six-mile journey. I'm going to do the TXA. Yeah, that'd be good. You can do a set of OBS. Arriving at hospital 11 minutes later, Adam delivers his still critically ill patient to the waiting emergency staff. That's one of the things we are there for. We will just bring some advanced decision making in terms of which hospital we're going to. If we won't go to the nearest hospital, we will travel a little bit further with an unstable patient to get them to the right major trauma centre. Let's get the stretcher, let's get something to get her out and get that sorted, all right? In Dudley, critical care paramedic Pete Edwards is fighting to control the seizures threatening 39-year-old building society clerk Emily's life. Emily, we're going to look after you, OK? Let's get a BM done and make sure her blood sugars aren't low. We've got her on oxygen, OK? If she starts really fitting again and it's prolonged, we'll give her some diazomols and obviously we'll just have to then do a bit of airway maintenance in case she goes out. And we'll just pop the SATS probe back on, just keep her eye on her SATS. Whether or not we have the condition, one in 20 of us will suffer a one-off epileptic seizure at some point and they can be fatal. Just have a look at that mine, make sure I've drawn up the right thing. It's diazomols and it's in date, OK? Yeah, 10 milligrams in 2 mil. All right. Nine minutes after the last one with a sedative anti-seizure medication on board, Emily's condition seems to be improving. Pop her onto a side just for, like, into the recovery position. Yeah. She is more alert, and her convulsions appear to have subsided. Yeah, super. Yeah, no, no, that's fine, that's fine. But Pete's critical care training makes him ever watchful. And even in the most severe cases, despite us giving anti-seizure medication, the patient continues to fit, uh, and this can become time-critical emergency. With a sedation, there's a risk her body could struggle to breathe. If we don't manage the airway and the brain is starved of oxygen, there is brain damage, brain death, and ultimately cardiac arrest. The priority now, get Emily to hospital. Emily, my love, can you hear me OK? Listen, we're going to get you up the hospital and get the doctor to look at you. We've just got to get you onto the stretching. I'm just going to pop the oxygen off for now. 
I'm going to sit you up nice and steady, just bend in the middle. Okay. Right, Emily, lean back against me and just have a moment because you've been lying down, all right? All right? Do you know where you are? No? It's a bit strange. We're going to help you. All we've got to do is get you onto him and get you nice and comfy. Okay, so we'll go on through. We'll have a little rock. So, one, two, and three. Up we go onto our feet. Lovely. Yeah. Super. Emily, swing your legs up. Let's get you comfy. That's it. The ambulance will take Emily to the nearest emergency department. Thankfully, on this occasion, she appears to have made a quite rapid recovery. Some patients will just have one seizure, make a recovery, and they're absolutely fine. But we do go to these patients who recover, and then sometimes it might be minutes later or, or, or even seconds later, they'll have a further seizures, and this can be quite complicated. And those sort of patients, we get them to hospital where they can be assessed further sometimes just to make sure there isn't anything more untoward uh, going on somewhere. I about the pint out of 10. Okay. In Stourbridge, critical care paramedic Tom Waters is trying to assess the damage to Daniel's hand after he sliced into it with an angle grinder. Ah. Okay, all right, bud. All right, bud. Ah. Turn your arm round. All right. You feel me touching you here? Yeah, okay. Daniel has a three inch wound, an inch and a half deep between his thumb and forefinger. Once the towel is removed, it starts bleeding freely again. We've got that thumb for me. Calm. Okay, all right. What we're going to do, buddy, is we're going to clean it up. It's in the corner bit of your thumb. That make you obviously know where it is. Lucky for Daniel, the blade stops short of the bone. Straighten the arm out for me. I'm sorry, I'm sorry, I'm sorry. Straighten Well done. I just want to straighten this hand for me. Daniel is fortunate. All his fingers are still there, and there's no obvious nerve damage. The wound will now be cleaned with saline solution and dressed to immobilise the fingers and help stop the bleeding. It's just obviously in the crease of his thumb. He's got good circulation here. Yeah, and he can feel me touching his hands. Yeah. Um, so and it's, boy, yeah, so I think it's just more soft tissue. Yeah. Um, we're going to cover it. Yep. And then I think we'll... Do you if we just take a picture? So yeah, 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 that's fine. One of the paramedics takes photographs of the wound to show to the hospital doctors in A&E so they can assess whether he needs immediate surgery. Yeah, nice and still. Right. Keep still for us, buddy. As soon as you've done this, we'll get you some pain relief. Last year, almost 5,000 people were admitted to hospital following accidents with power tools. I'm going to bandage that up. Yeah. Yeah, it's going to be a little bit painful for a little while. I'm sorry, mate. When are you working next? Don't say Monday. Yeah. <laughs> it won't be. I think it probably feels and looks worse than what it is. Yeah. I think it needs to be cleaned, it needs to be x-rayed. Yeah. And it needs to be stitched back together. Cheers for that. <laughs> I don't know how you look could look in it to be fair. Yeah. Oh, no. <laughs> <laughs> it's all right, mate. There you go. Just take your time, nice and slow. We're in no rush. Feel all right? Yeah. Let me just walk behind you. With Daniel now recovered enough to walk out to the ambulance, Tom is happy to leave him in the care of the local crew for the journey to hospital. He'll go to the local a &E where he'll get it cleaned. He most likely will have some form of antibiotics and an X-ray, and then it'll be decided onto there if he needs specialist care to treat that part of his hand. It's very much in the forefront of our minds that we want him to get the best care for his hand, so he's a young chap, he's a labourer, we obviously need to get him back to work as soon as possible. It could have been a lot worse, it's still going to be a really painful injury, but hopefully I'll have a really quick recovery. One of the trauma team's key areas of expertise is paediatric emergency care. Being called to a critically ill child is every paramedic's worst nightmare, so they need to be able to rely on a high level of skills and training. Breathing? Yes, he is. Are they conscious? Yeah, yes, he is. And what's wrong with the patient? Um, he's just gone completely down the stairs. He fell down the stairs? Yes, he's two. 
top to bottom was it? Literally, yes. I think his wrist might be a bit broken. Oh, and did he bang his head or has he landed on his I'm feet? not sure. I don't know. He landed kind of upside down at the bottom. Six two. Six two. I've got your dates of two year old that's fallen down the stairs. Is that correct, Donna? Uh, that's correct, mate. Yeah, top to bottom of the stairs. There's more than three meters of water. Child's had a head injury. They are conscious, but they have clearly got a fracture wrist as well. Roger, that's all received. Thanks, Mike. In Albury, critical care paramedic Faye Pollock is en route to a code red emergency. A two-year-old child has fallen three metres downstairs, landing on his head. Just confirming that he has fallen top to bottom of the stairs. He's got a head injury and a wrist injury. An ambulance has been called, but with the potential for life-threatening injuries, the trauma team's enhanced skills are also required. Obviously, because it's a child and they have their whole lives ahead of them. The last thing they want to do is be fighting for their life or be disabled in any way because of an accident. Three minutes later, Faye is on scene, ready to be briefed by the ambulance crew. This is young Josh, two yes. years of age. Mum said he's got his big habit at the moment of doing Superman down the stairs. But Which she's in here mind. and she's heard thump, 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 thump. Yep. I haven't touched him, I haven't done anything. Done we anything. literally okay. just got here, found out the history, that's it. OK, I'll have a chat to Mum Mitchell. Is he, is he acting as normal now? He no. seems quiet. Yeah, he's yeah. very hyper, Josh is. He's right. constantly on the go. Mum Rachel confirms there has been a worrying change in Josh's behaviour. The worst case scenario is that Josh has fractured his skull in the fall and has a potentially fatal bleed on his brain. Um, this, this, yes, is, is almost as if he's either covering his eyes or his, his arms hurting, I'm not yeah. sure, but this is unusual for him to put his arm across. No, we can do that with strangers. So that might be a comfort thing, the yeah. fact that we're yeah. right, yeah. okay. Critically ill or injured children can appear to be okay, but then suddenly go downhill. So the little things like that, only mums yes, yeah, 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 yeah. know, but it says a lot to us in yes, that. Yes, definitely. He's, you know, he's not photophobic. Josh, can we put the sink onto your thumb? No. 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 Josh needs to go to hospital to be scanned. First, though, Faye needs to take his blood pressure and heart rate, but Josh is too distressed. He hasn't been sick, has he? He's no, not... no, no sickness. No, don't. If he's gone down the stairs the way he is, you're not going to come down without the mark, are you? No, you're not sick. Because I've not really been able to get too easy. close to be able to yeah. really get my hands on. And the only thing I'm doing when I get in the room is distress. Makes him more upset. At the moment, yeah. Mm. He has also been guarding his left arm in a way that suggests he might have broken it in the fall. I tell you what, let's see if we can try a little trick. Can I have can I have Mickey a second? Is that Mickey? Mickey let me just have Mickey one. for a second. Let's see. Let's let's put Oh, don't you want to give Mickey? That's a good sign that his arms are alright. Yeah, yeah. Yourself as a trick. Encouraged by Josh's reaction, Faye tries again to attach the monitoring equipment. Which finger? Which finger? Do we do it on this one? Do you want to try? Should we try it on your foot? Yeah, come on. But he's not falling for it. Mommy, do it. Mommy, do it. He's certainly a good colour in his lips, good colour in his face. The fact that he's able to understand and say no are all the signs that I think he's probably just shocked himself. Yeah, distressed himself. Oh. To help soothe Josh, Faye wants to administer some paracetamol. It'll make you feel better, sweetheart. Good boy. Come on, Josh. Okay. Oh, that's a good boy. Well, well done, Mum. <laughs> now you've done that before. <laughs> Paramedic Nikki has a trick up her sleeve to try and take Josh's mind off his troubles. 
Distracted by the bubbles, the paramedics managed to attach the oxygen saturation and heart rate monitor to his toes. Yay, well done, Josh. Shall we see if we can get him over there? You can catch him. Can you reach Yay. over that way? Oh, well done. That has worked. It's a treat. Well done, you. Quick thing. I like the puzzle. Yeah, this is a work of amusement. <laughs> Doesn't matter about the patients. <laughs> <laughs> Apparently, the wounds on his legs are from previous Superman yeah, impressions. Yeah. It was her. Well, it doesn't stop him. It's excitement, though, Dad. It's the excitement of going headfirst down the stairs. Josh looks to be making good progress, but Faye still wants him to go to hospital to be checked over by the emergency doctors. Mum, is there anything that you need? No. Immediately. I've already done it. Oh, you're, oh God, wow. That is one prepared mother. Bye bye. Thank you. You take care, Mum. Well done for keeping you cool. <laughs> she leaves him in the care of the ambulance crew for the six mile journey to Birmingham City Hospital. So you're never quite sure what injuries they may have and as, as you saw, he's so scared and he's so um, anxious the fact that he's got three strange people in the room. He immediately curled up into a ball on Grandma's lap. So there was no way that we were going to be able to assess him for his injuries properly there until the paramedic got an absolute beauty with those bubbles.